Um, so those that don't know me, my name's Jamie Rance. I'm currently employed here at the University of Canberra. I've been here for about 12 months or so. Um, I've been nursing for about uh, nine years and the majority of that time has been in emergency departments and intensive care units, mainly in Canberra. Uh, throughout those nine or 10 years or so, I've held various roles, um, doing research, doing education, uh, particularly as a critical care educator for ACT Health. Uh, then also uh, having clinical roles and most recently as one of the clinical managers of Calvary Hospital Emergency Department prior to coming here. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of intensive care and emergency nurses in disasters. My background in disasters uh, started really around the Canberra bushfires. Uh, I was a volunteer member of St John Ambulance and a registered nurse at the time and I assisted in the establishment of one of the evacuation centres in Canberra from a clinical perspective, so establishing the, the medical needs and so on of people coming to the evacuation centres. Uh, since then, I've also been involved in the, the Victorian bushfires and uh, the most recent Queensland uh, extreme weather events, and in both of those cases, I was involved in the national coordination and movement of healthcare professionals uh, to those jurisdictions to help out um, at that particular time. I haven't done any overseas disaster response as such, um, but in the last five years or so, I've been doing a lot of research into the roles of nurses in disasters uh, and other aspects that affect people's roles, such as willingness and education and so on in disasters. So I like my sessions to be a little bit interactive, so feel free to, to jump up and yell out and ask questions as we go. Don't necessarily need to hold yourselves with your excitement till the end. Um, all the research and presentations and papers and stuff that I've done are all on my website, so I'll whack this presentation up there as well, so you can just jump online there and, and browse through all the stuff um, that I've done there. So, today we're going to have a look at a few things. First of all, we're going to define da disasters, and we're going to focus on the role of nurses in disasters, and in particular have a look at the in-hospital role, uh, and then have a look at your out-of-hospital role, because we know that nurses go to disasters, yeah, it's not necessarily only in hospitals. Going to talk a little bit about willingness, ability to attend disasters, uh, education, and then we're going to talk and focus on other things as well that affect people's role in disasters. So, first of all, this is just a, a, an overview of the steps that occur prior to a disaster happening. Okay? So, first of all, we need to have some kind of a hazard or some danger. And I'll use the example of um, an, an island a Pacific island, perhaps, uh, surrounded by water. The hazard in this case is the water. It could cause some damage. Commonly it doesn't, unless sea levels rise for any particular reason, but most commonly it doesn't cause any type of danger or harm. However, there is a risk, and the risk is the probability of an event occurring. Okay? An event is something that has negative influences on a particular structure or person or whatever else. Commonly in the media, the media will refer to disasters as the event. So the event is Hurricane Katrina. The event is the bushfire. Yeah? Often they call that, oh, it's a Hurricane Katrina, as the actual disaster itself, whereas the disaster is something that results from the event. Because if Hurricane Katrina happened in the middle of nowhere, then it wouldn't necessarily be a disaster, would it? So it's only a disaster because other things happen as well. One is that there's some element of impact. So if we take our island again, and let's say there's been an earthquake off the island, now we've got elevated seawaters and potentially a tsunami. Um, the impact will be when the tsunami actually hits the shores of that Pacific island. It's going to cause damage and destruction. And as I alluded to before, it depends on how um, much infrastructure that particular island has. Damage differs between societies. So if we took the society of Japan, for example, and compared that to Indonesia, who both had tsunamis, we would note that there's a vast difference in the amount of damage that had occurred, primarily due to the people's ability to be prepared and the infrastructure around the islands. So for example, Japan had massive gates, which when they know a tsunami is coming, they can close these gates to present uh, prevent seawater and stuff flowing through, whereas Indonesia obviously wasn't quite as well prepared in those circumstances. If we get damage, this could result in a disaster. So what is a disaster? Does anybody know? How would you define that? 
So that's the event. Yeah, floods is an event. Yeah, so disruption and damage to regular life. So we, so we can have, yeah, absolutely. So we can have um, infrastructure damage, sanitation damage, etc., which may result in a disaster. So there are 12 societal factors that people need to have to, to live or determinants of, of health and well-being. They include things like sanitation, water, infrastructure, communications, etc., etc. So we can have a disaster occurring to one of those things. But what kind of disaster are we talking about? Death and disease. So we're talking about disasters that may have an impact on the health system. Yeah, The health system becomes so overwhelmed that we can no, no longer cope. And we need to make some decisions normally about whether people will die because we won't have a particular action. We don't have the resources to put into, say, this person's life. Whereas in the normal circumstances, we actually might be able to do that. And they would be triaged as a Category 1 in our EDs. We're going to tag them with a particular tag which says that this person's non-salvageable and therefore they need to, they're going to die. So there's some really hard ethical decisions that need to be made in disasters. So that's one element. And it can kind of be defined as... Um, a disaster can somewhat be defined as the need for external support to help sustain your normal health infrastructure. So if you need support from outside your jurisdiction um, to sustain a normal health service for those people that are presenting or that you've gone out to, um, that could be classified as a disaster. We won't argue that ACT Health may have a disaster every day with 100 nurses short, etc., etc. Maybe not. Um, so that's how we'll, we'll define disaster. And we're looking at it from a health perspective, not necessarily from those other structural perspectives. So this is a list of, of disasters that you may be familiar with. Um, the ones in black are ones that have occurred on Australian shores. And the ones in blue are ones in which we've had an Australian response to. So the Department of Health and Ageing has a national incident room where they monitor uh, disease and illness and disasters that occur and if we need to deploy uh, health teams to particular situations or if we need to monitor situations where Australians may be involved, um, the National Incident Room in Department of Health and Ageing, uh, they do that. So the ones in blue are the ones that they've been monitoring over the, over the last little while. As you can see over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of disasters which Australia's been involved in. Interestingly too, the literature around disasters has been very little until the last 10 years. And this may just be the reason why, because we are more aware of it, we've had more involvement in it and so on. So everyone can see and recognise some disasters up there. You may actually have been involved in some of them um, as a citizen, as a responder, or, or working in your emergency departments or ICUs or hospitals or wherever. Some interesting ones up there. Pandemic H1N1, was it a disaster? Anybody? No? Yes? No? Yeah, so it was kind of like a disaster in slow motion. It wasn't like the bomb went off, disaster, or the fire hit, disaster. It was something that we, were, we knew about. It was delayed. We expected a large number of patients, and we put into place some buffering or some capacity to deal with the event. And... In most cases, and we're going to talk about it later on, that meant that the, the shop fronts of hospitals, the emergency departments and the GP clinics and the community settings and so on, had to change the way that they actually went about their normal business. So it was kind of a, a disaster in slow motion. Um, Queensland and Victoria stream weather events, from a health perspective, a disaster? Not really, didn't really put much strain on the, on the health system at all really. Um, Black Saturday and the Victorian bushfires. Disaster. So for the, the nation, not necessarily a disaster. For the state of Victoria, it wasn't necessarily a disaster because their trauma centres and their burn centres weren't overflowing with patients and they never had to make decisions that they couldn't save somebody based on the resources that they had. But for the Communities that were directly involved in the bushfires, it most definitely was a disaster. They didn't have enough health 
resources on the grounds where the bushfires were occurring. So we can define disasters a little bit differently and you could argue from this list that Australia, whilst we have some experience in extreme events, which result in a number of casualties or a number of deaths, we haven't really experienced a stress on our health system of a disaster, not like 9-11 or London bombings or even Christchurch earthquake or so on. We get the major surges all at once. Does everyone agree with that? Feel free to disagree. You're in Tracy? Yeah, so out of this whole list, Tracy is probably the um, one which could be classified as a disaster. It had some unique elements to it. Um, you know, it lacked things such as communication infrastructure. We didn't know about it until a day after it happened, whereas today that just wouldn't happen. People on Twitter and Facebook would, would know about it. Um, Twitter and Facebook's interesting. So Christchurch earthquake, um, I followed various Twitter feeds and knew about Christchurch earthquake about an hour before the news and the media started reporting about Christchurch earthquake just by being on Twitter. So it's not all about Miley Cyrus and whoever else. It can be used for good as well. So I want to focus on, on role now, and I'm going to be controversial about your role, hopefully. So what is your role in a disaster? What are you going to do? What you're told. <laughs> no one's going to tell you anything. You're just expected to do stuff, aren't you? What are you going to do? Yeah, what are you prioritising? Of. So <laughs> Righto, Ash. That's real good. <laughs> Anybody else can beat that? Can anyone beat that? Prioritising the care of people. Good idea. Hope so. So think of your, your setting. So you're in ICU or you're in ED. What things are you going to be doing? Disaster's coming. Ah, what are you doing? So yeah. So we need to know what, what human resources we have available. Yep. And we need to know what physical resources is in, you know, IV giving sets and fluids and so on. Yeah, exactly right. It's kind of too late, though, really, if that's all you've got. Um, cool. So you're from an ED, so you want to move out all the non-urgent people to somewhere else. Where do you move your patients to? Yeah, you do. Uh, the eleventh floor. Yeah. You don't have an 11th floor. <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't have a ward that has just the ability to absorb patients. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> so, as I mentioned earlier, there's little literature or research which actually says what you will be doing in a disaster. Um, it's anecdotal, and it's normally stories told between people about, oh, we did this, oh, and we did that. So it's important if you are involved in a disaster, even to write that up, to say, hey, in a disaster, this happened, or I did X, Y, or Z. Triage. So you mentioned prioritising care, Ash. Well, that's on my list. Um, triage is something that's important. There's this uh, idea that a disaster happens, 100 people are going to present to your emergency department. How are you going to triage them all in time? How are you going to triage them efficiently and effectively? What are you going to do, ED nurses? Have more than one triage nurse. Cool. So more than one triage nurse, where do you get that other triage nurse from? Off the floor. They're looking after just you know, three or four people. That'd be right. Come out and you start triaging. So you start triaging. Where are you putting these patients? Into beds, maybe, because you've made some room. Maybe you just pushed them out into the corridor. Uh, maybe there are a couple of beds available around the place. Yep, so you start to move your patients into the emergency department somehow. But you're out the front triaging. I don't know who's caring for those people. Who's, who does the triaging? The normal number of triage nurses will do the triaging. Who does the caring of the patients? The normal number of nurses caring for the patients care for the patients. Disasters and roles in disasters. Disaster is kind of like a normal day that's gone haywire. You know those really, really busy shifts where you just go, man, that was so over the top and really busy. At the end of the day, you're still doing your role. You're still doing the normal things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. You're just doing it a lot faster. Yeah, that's kind of what you're going to be doing in a disaster, in hospital. What about decontamination? So you've got these patients coming now. You know they've been involved in an incident, CBR-type incident. Um, how, do, how do you manage these patients when they arrive in your, at the front doors of your hospital? Decontaminate them. 
how do you decontaminate them at your hospital? Yes, a shower, yeah. ED at Calvary also has a shower, yeah, when, in those big white containers, everyone's seen those out the front of the ED? You pull them out and they've got these tents in them, you set them up with poles and then you've got like little stretcher things where people go over the top. Um, in Canberra, because it's quite cold, we even have little boilers so you can boil the water and make it nice and warm so the patients don't get cold when we, when we start to spray them with water because we want to put all the patients through this thing where essentially it's, it's just water that we're hosing them down with through this little tent. Yeah, so who sets up the decontamination shower? Have you guys in AD seen, pulled out, played with the decontamination shower? Once or twice, maybe if you're lucky, seen it pulled out. So the nurses might set that up, but the realistic thing is that nurses are gonna be inside caring for the patients, yeah? So who's gonna set up the decontamination shower? The ward is a good idea because they're not going to be out finding resources or pushing your patients out of the ED. Yep, okay, Em. So let's not use the wardies because they've got a, a pretty valuable role in doing that. <laughs> who, who else is there? The security guys? Maybe not because, you know, when the alarms go off in your hospitals, normally all the automatic doors open. So it's a good idea for the security guys to kind of stand at the automatic doors. They're automatically opened. The terrorists and stuff can just run on in. Uh, not that I would, but you could up one end of the hospital just break the fire alarm and go to the ED and all the doors are open, but don't do that. So, end of the day, no one's going to set up the decontamination shower because they're doing their normal roles. It's not a normal role for an ED nurse, for the wardsman, for the security guys to set up the decontamination shower. You could find other people, auxiliary type people, and maybe that's biomed or maintenance or I don't know who. All these patients need is to be hosed down. What do you got outside your ED departments? Fire hoses, crack out the fire hose and just spray everybody with the fire hose. Why not? The other thing you want to do is accommodate surge. Yeah, you're going to have this massive surge. Everyone knows what I mean by surge? Yeah, and surge capacity. What's surge capacity mean? Yeah, so really a hospital should, hospital should be running on a capacity of about 90%. 80 to 90 percent so you've always got a bit of surge you've got a bit of movement up and down etc etc most hospitals though don't run like that uh, and most eds and icus don't run like that they're normally full yeah normally like 100 percent capacity and sometimes overflowing and patients waiting to come in but you're going to need to accommodate surge to some degree and that might be lining patients up along corridors uh canberra bushfires in the ed um, getting chairs out because we knew that most people came in with either respiratory illness or stuff in their eyes so you could just line them up and grab bags of saline and just wash out people's eyes or set them up next to oxygen tanks and everyone just have oxygen on that's a place where you can put people to monitor them yeah that's accommodating surge um, we're going to talk about some strategies in surge in a moment but this is um, from the Canberra hospital uh, during and following the Canberra bushfires um, this is kind of representing three hourly workloads, so each of these are broken up into a three hour segment. And we know that the Canberra bushfires really hit around 3 p.m. ish on that Saturday afternoon. You can see here that prior to the main event occurring, there were still presentations relating to bushfires prior to the main event occurring. So everybody knew that something just wasn't quite right. We just hadn't put the pieces together. And if you're standing outside at midnight on this night here, you would have seen hot ash and stuff falling over the city. Something just wasn't quite right. But it didn't really trigger in people's minds that this is going to be disastrous. So here you can see massive spikes in the number of presentations to the emergency department. Obviously, Peter's off overnight. Uh, and then everyone wakes up in the morning around 6 o'clock and, and represents again. The grey underneath is kind of the average from the quarter period the year before. Um, all this really shows is that there's massive spikes in the number of presentations per, per three hour block, which we would expect. How does the first real critically unwell patient arrive to a disaster? In the back of a car. They don't come in an ambulance. The first time that you'll find out about your disaster patient or a disaster occurring is they're going to come by private car. Um, Canberra bushfires was an example of that. Some of the most critically ill patients arrived by private car. Ambulance just doesn't have the resources and the ability to manage the, 
the number of patients and the number of people calling because we would start to rely in today's society on just picking up the phone and calling for help. Good, good examples of that were Cyclone Yasi where um, the Premier of Queensland s publicly said that for the next period, 12 hours, we're just not going to have emergency services out on the roads. You guys need to look after yourselves as a community. Um, we'll come to being self-sufficient in a little bit later on. But we need to come up with some strategies to accommodate this surge. Uh, we know a few things about the types of patients that come to hospitals in Australia following disasters, and that is that they're pretty minor type patients. There's not many critically unwell, um, and the majority of them would be discharged home. So what about workforces? We've mentioned that there's going to be stretched in terms of workforce. What, what kind of strategies do we have in place to manage workforce stresses during disasters? Because we're going to need more than your... 14 nurses on a shift, aren't we? And we might need it for a, a long period of time. Canberra bushfires, it may only be a couple of days, but other events may be quite longer. So what strategies do you have in place in your workplace do you, that you know of to sustain your workforce? Who comes in to help you? Is burnout? Do you stay on for 24 hours? So text messaging, yep, yep. So we know in, yeah, we know in disasters though, with with communications, telephones, and texts and stuff, um, don't kind of work. And in terms of the Canberra bushfire, if you send a text message, you might actually get that a couple of days later. Yeah. So major public gatherings are good examples of that. So grand final day out of stadiums and so on, uh, Royal Easter Show, City of the Surf, all those events, communications just cannot cope. So, yeah, so people go back to relying on things that are stable. So community radio in every capital city in every state and territory has an emergency radio channel. So if you need messages put out, you put it out on that channel. And for Canberra, it's triple six, I think. ABC is the emergency channel. Um, so you might need to listen to that and if you need extra nurses or whatever else, you may be relying on those types of strategies or the internet if you've been able to establish internet access and so on as well or email. So who though, let's just say your disaster's been going on for a few days, who is going to come and, and assist you now? Who outside of your particular nursing group that you employ is going to come and help at your hospital? Probably nobody else, really. But we should come up with some strategies. And one idea that I've got is that we should use health care professional students in disasters. Commonly those health students that have already been, for example, on a third year placement in your ED or your ICU, they know the system, they know how it works, they can kind of care for a patient. But you might be able to get those types of people looking after patients with a registered nurse supervising a number of them. So there's lots of different strategies that we need to come up with. And having a list of people who are available and willing is another thing, and we'll come to that in a moment. Influenza was interesting. What strategies did we come up with for influenza? As I mentioned earlier, it resulted in us changing the way that we did things in EDs and ICUs. What kinds of things did we do differently? For H1N1 2009 in particular. Two years ago. Pardon? Isolation, yeah, we've only got so many isolation areas within our hospitals though, don't we? So Mars, personal protective equipment. Set up a clinic. Yeah. So H1N1 was interesting because there's a bit of hype about how unwell people were going to get from it. But really, at the end of the day, it was probably, you're better off getting H1N1 than the common flu of the, the season. Um, H1N1 did put a lot of stress and strain on our on our... Um, health system and this is from the influenza assessment clinic at Calvary Hospital which was set up um, and as you can see here that this is the number of presentations that came through the emergency department at the hospital and quickly they realised that they needed to establish a place where we didn't have people with potential flu-like symptoms coming into an unwell population potentially and being sorted and to move them to another area co-located still accessible to the medical services and so on of the hospital, um, but away from the emergency department itself. So if you came in and you complained of flu-like symptoms, you were sent to this area. Essentially, the premise was that if you could walk into the emergency department, that you would walk out again. 
So if you came in walking, you went to the influenza assessment clinic, and if you came in on an ambulance trolley, you probably needed admission because you were a bit more unwell than just the person who walked in. Here you can see massive spikes of like 150 people presenting per day with flu-like symptoms. Um, but overall, you can see here that there was an average of about 35-ish or so uh, presentations to the emergency department or influenza assessment clinic at that point in time uh, for this month. So one strategy is to establish an influenza assessment clinic. Other strategies include uh, having dedicated triage nurses, having separate little waiting areas and so on in your emergency department. Depends really on how the impact is going to be. This occurred, these spikes occurred around the time of um, media announcements regarding influenza and also uh, in terms of contact tracing. So one, we had primary school children turn up because someone in their class had H1N1, for example, so you'd expect a spike at that point in time. Note this is a Canberra population. So here on Saturdays and Sundays, everyone's quite well. Uh, but during the week, and particularly Mondays, everybody likes to turn up to the influenza assessment clinic and be, they're sick. That's Canberra. I'm going to flick back to, to this bit here, and this is about ICUs now. So we did a study at Canberra Hospital ICU to have a look at their uh, influenza um, triage tool. Someone in, the, in Canada established an influenza triage tool which said, if influenza occurs, we're going to need a number of ventilators and respiratorators and so on for patients that are unwell. So we need to have some ethical, reasonable way to determine who gets a ventilator and who doesn't. So this was a tool that they designed. Um, as you can see here, it's got a number of inclusion and exclusion type criteria. So essentially, if you've got um, respiratory failure, you're included. But then you're excluded if you've got trauma, major burns, if you're palliative care, if you're over 85, if you had a cardiac arrest, um, if you've had major surgery that's been elective, if you had end of organ failure such as heart, liver, lungs, etc., etc., you get excluded from the ICU, potentially because you're just not going to survive or have good outcomes anyway. Whereas we know that people who get influenza are normally kind of less than 50 years of age, they recover, go back to being you know, full well and so on into the community. So what we thought we'd do is take a, a month's sample, retrospective out of the patients that had been in the ICU, and we applied this criteria, and it has a number of steps to it. As you can see up the top, we started with 119 presentations to this ICU in this one month period. Um, and we started to go through this step-by-step -step inclusion exclusion criteria about who would actually be in the ICU at the end of the day. The different colours just re represent um, who's a high priority, who's a low priority, who's going to be discharged and who's just not going to kind of get a look in in the emergency, in, in the ICU. At the end of it, we had a number of, after the initial assessment, out of the 119, we only had 10 people that we would actually keep in the ICU in that one month period who met this criteria. After, you, you obviously do a reassessment of the patients, after 48 hours and then 120 hours, um, and at those point in time, there's really only one patient that was left. So maybe or not this triage tool works, I don't really know. Um, but what it does highlight that if you apply some kind of principles to who you triage and how you work out who's going to get a ventilator, um, it becomes a lot more tricky probably than just applying somebody's tool to who does that. There's a lot more, more to it. But it's a, something you need to think about because we only have limited resources in terms of um, ventilators. An example of the need to triage ICU bed capacity was barley bombings. So barley bombings, we knew that we were going to get X number of patients to Australia. Australia only has burns capacity of about 30, 40 beds maximum. Um, so if we get 40 patients arriving in Australia or from Australia uh, who have been burnt, we need to work out how we're going to move them all around the country. And the major lesson learnt from barley bombings was about our transport capacity to get people from Darwin to these other hospitals. Um, they would ring up, uh, for example, Victoria and say, Victoria, how many aeroplanes do you have that could transport patients from Darwin to Melbourne? Uh, South Australia, how many do you have? Western Australia, how many do you have? And everyone would come back, oh, we've got four, or oh, we've got five, and we've got seven, and so on. And they're like, awesome, we need all these planes in Darwin so we can move our patients out, etc." What they soon realised, though, was that the planes that they were counting were contracted to Victoria, and the same ones were also contracted to South Australia, the same ones were also contracted to Western Australia if an event occurs. So really the capacity to transport patients was about a third of what they really thought. 
So there's a lot of resource issues that we don't realise will happen until we start to put in place some ideas and plans that happen. Likewise, I'm not going to go into plans in your hospitals, but hospital plans kind of work, but when disaster happens, they don't really work because there's all these other factors that you just don't take into account. I would even argue that the best disaster plans are probably a one-page thing about stuff and then to have associated with those action cards. So, hey, you're a nurse looking after a patient, here's your action card. You're the triage nurse, this is your action card. And on that it tells you who to talk to, who not to talk to, who the contacts are, what kinds of things you need to do step by step. At the end of the day, that's what most people put into their disaster type plans, but they're so inaccessible in folders. You have a little cards, go, hey, you're the triage nurse, this is what you need to do and who you talk to. And then when you get phone calls from people that you're not meant to talk to, you just go, sorry, not meant to talk to you. You've got to talk to somebody else. Otherwise, and you'll soon find that in a disaster, everybody wants to talk to the same person. Everybody's calling the shift coordinator or the bed manager or the nurse in charge of this ward or the nurse in charge of that ward. They can't field that many phone calls. So you need to be systematic about who we're actually talking to. So that's kind of in-hospital stuff briefly. The other element is out of hospitals, yeah? So nurses go to disasters, we know that. Uh, in Australia, nurses went to Christchurch, nurses have been to Pakistan and so on and so on. So nurses go kind of everywhere um, external to Australia. And we also know that nurses respond internally. So they go to the Victorian bushfires and the Queensland floods and so on. I've put this picture up here because everyone loves koalas. Although, what was his name? Does anyone remember the name of the koala? Lucky, Lucky died recently. So not so lucky. <laughs> Pardon? He was old. He looks old. <laughs> he looks old. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about briefly now is nurses' roles out of hospital. So this is more my interest than the in-hospital stuff. Um, we surveyed all the nurses that went to the Victorian bushfires and worked in the pre-hospital or out-of-hospital environment. So there's about 50 of them. Um, of about half replied to this survey that we sent out. Uh, we asked them about their clinical experience, their disaster education, um, their disaster experience and so on. I'll put this up here for a reason that we'll come to later. And this is where they have, what kinds of training or mock exercises they had participated in prior to this event. You can see up here that uh, airport disasters, pretty high. Um, Non-specific kind of multiple casualty disasters, pretty high. Rail disasters, tabletops, and down the bottom, you know, shopping centres, CBR and that kind of stuff. We'll come back to why that's interesting in a moment. We had a look at the kinds of roles that people did. Um, and as I said, we only had 20, we had about 24 responders to this survey. Uh, and as you can see here, people undertook multiple roles. So the majority of people did some clinical element. Other things that are interesting, however, is that about 50% of people did some kind of administrative type role in addition to that clinical stuff. So we want to know more about what that actually was um, and what they actually did around all of these other types of clinical or command roles. So then we survey how we did telephone interviews with a, about 15 of them to, to de delve into a little bit more detail about what they actually did. And they came up with these, these various themes. So the first main theme was about being prepared. And in this, the clinician stated that they had appropriate levels of training. And I'll come back to why that's important in a moment as well. They had an adequate clinical experience and they had enough resources. In terms of resources, they did things like pack the car full of medical gear, trauma stuff, resus stuff, jump in the car and drive up to the bushfires. In terms of the clinical experience, they came from a varied clinical background, from being mental health to ICU to EDs to um, being researchers to educators to everything. And they thought that they had appropriate levels of training. The majority of them had a bachelor's degree and some had undertaken some postgraduate studies. None had done any postgraduate studies in disaster health or emergency management or any of those things. Then we spoke to them about their roles because initially we thought the nurses just do like clinical stuff, go out and treat patients. But when we got our survey back, we saw that that wasn't the case. So they actually did minimal clinical care. So the clinical care that they did provide was things like washing out eyes for the firefighters or providing small dressings for lacerations for members of the community. 
That was about it. The majority of their time was spent being an emotional supporter. So they were emotionally supporting their colleagues and members of the community. Members of the community would come up to them and like to talk about their experiences about what happened in the fires. And they thought that was a better place to vent more so than potentially going to their, their neighbours and so on who have also experienced horrific events. Nurse as coordinator, and this was like a hospital coordinator type role where they would uh, find out where particular resources were positioned. Uh, they would find out where beds were available and in one instance um, they kind of turned up to one of the emergency departments in the area and, and didn't take over the emergency department but used the spaces within that. And it, because of that, uh, we kind of turned them problem solvers. And this problem solving was also about things such as uh, patients arrive at evacuation centres with sentimental items, photo albums and computers under arms. They don't arrive with a list of medications, they don't arrive with their medications, and a lot of the problem solving is about determining the people's previous medical and surgical backgrounds, what medications they're on and how we're going to find those medications. The minimal clinical care element and so on was really about primary health and emotional support. That's why we think that most of them said that they had an appropriate level of training. They didn't need to be theatre nurses, they didn't need to be an ICU nurse, they needed to be a primary health type nurse and have a bit of caring element to it. And similar to having adequate clinical experience and so on, and having enough resources where they obviously packed their car full of this resource and trauma gear, but they didn't use any of it. Thanks, Holly. So why this picture then? Well, when I think of a firefighter, I think of guys holding hoses, putting out fires. I didn't necessarily think of someone holding some water up to a koala. So maybe nurses do more than what we perceive nurses would do in a disaster. And that's why I put that photo there. So I'll quickly fly through a couple of things about willingness and education. So we did a, um, a survey and focus groups with emergency nurses. We started with emergency nurses because we know that they're kind of at the front door of, of hospitals and they're going to see disaster type patients and ask people about would you be willing to attend a disaster. So if a disaster happens, are you guys happy to go? Yeah, put up your hand if you're happy to go. Who's happy to go? Yeah, everybody. But. And this is where the but comes in. So the but uh, is these things here. So it depends on what's happening at home. Do you have kids? Do you have elderly parents? Do you have a dog, etc.? may depend on your willingness to come into work. Depends on what's happening at work. If your manager's an idiot and the staff around you are idiots, you're not going to come to work because you just go, I might as well stay and protect my own property than go in there and help them. Um, depends on the information you're provided. So you're all going to come to this disaster. Awesome. You're only going to be there for about eight hours. Everybody happy with that? Yep. Um, except now we find out that it's some kind of respiratory illness. We don't quite know what it is and we may need to isolate you for seven days. Are you happy to come into work now? Who's going to come into work? We need some nurses. No nurses. One. Mum, maybe. Oh no, she's putting a, <laughs> a pen to her mouth, not putting her hand up. Um, and when we talk about workforce strategies, we need to understand that people are not going to come to work in a disaster because there's other priorities in their lives. And we don't really take that into account. Uh, those people that are at work, it's a bit too bad, so sad. But those people that are on days off, on annual leave, etc., cetera, um, have decisions about making, to, to make about whether or not they actually want to come to work. So it depends on the type of disaster, the degree of risk and the kinds of people you're working with. We spoke about that. Then there's this element of being unspoken about, you know, we've got a moral duty to do that. Um, what is a disaster anyway? I don't really know what I'll be doing when I get there. I think I'm just going to be doing triage because everyone needs to triage. Um, and it eventually comes down to making some personal decisions and choices about whether or not you're actually going to go to work. So that's a willingness stuff. So let's say you're willing. Now, actually, do you have the ability? So one person's willing. Awesome. Do you have the ability? This is Queensland River and that's your car. I don't know how you get into work. So whilst you might be willing, you may not necessarily be able to come to work. Let's say you jump the river somehow, you're awesome at that, um, and you find a car and take hold of that, and you get into your car, but now there's traffic congestion. So although you want to go to work, you've got the ability to go to work, you're still kind of stuck at that point in time and can't go to work. Canberra was another example of that where the city was kind of cut in half um, Tuggeranong was segregated from North Canberra in terms of fire coming right across the ridges and so on. People at points in time could not go north and south. So that's ability. So where do you learn about disaster stuff? 
well, undergraduate place is a good place to start. We should teach everybody in undergraduate programs about disasters. However, we did a survey, or a survey was done, with all the universities in Australia, um, and there was only about one that actually taught some element of disaster stuff or mentioned it in undergraduate programs. So then that really puts a reliance on the clinical institutions to provide you with the education about disaster health and what your role's going to be, doesn't it? If you don't learn it at uni, that's where you, you learn that kind of stuff. In-services is probably the most common place where you do that. Who's been to an in-service about disasters? No, because you go to in-service about, oh, one, or you're brushing a fly. <laughs> um, you've, so you, in-services are normally on about the day-to-day -day business of your department or unit. Yeah, oh, patients with chest pain, shortness of breath, we've got this new ventilator, etc., etc. It's not about the thing that may happen at some point in time, but unlikely to occur, maybe. So we don't learn about it in in-service type sessions. Maybe we should do it at postgraduate levels. Yeah, because we know that particularly in intensive care and, and ED, the majority of nurses will go on and do some kind of postgraduate education. So maybe we should be doing it in, in this environment. Well, we did another study um, and we surveyed uh, emergency nursing programs within Australia and we wanted to have a look at the disaster content and type and if they actually did anything about disasters. There's 12 universities in Australia that offer emergency department specific programs. Um, of those, 10 replied to our, our survey. Um, we asked them about their, their content and what they actually included in their course. So this is a list which is made up from the competencies from the International Council of Nurses and World Health Organization have a joint competency statement. And also there's a new textbook out about disasters for nursing. Um, and we've got some of these from the contents pages of that. So, in reply, the red boxes mean that pretty much none of the courses cover this, this stuff. Of the 10 that replied, only seven talked about disasters at all and didn't cover this stuff. Disaster exercises, didn't talk about incident systems, didn't talk about management of dead and dying, but we know that, and Victoria bushfires is a good example of this, the majority of people died more so than lived really or in, in a roundabout way. They did talk about things such as a hospital response, uh, disaster triage, the nurse's role in disaster, disaster plans, disaster types and examples of disasters. They're the kinds of things we'd expect people to talk about. Oh, there's bushfires and nurses do this and this is your disaster plan that goes with that. The other parts, health effects and mental health in relation to disasters, role of other organisations and where you, where you fit in, communication techniques and so on in disasters wasn't talked about at all. Showed a number of things. One is that there's inconsistency in the teaching of postgraduate education, particularly around emergency nursing, that uh, someone who graduates with a graduate certificate from one university doesn't really mean to say that it's the same competencies and standards as someone who graduates from another university, potentially, with those same, same level of knowledge or ability. It wouldn't be awesome to say, hey, graduate uh, diploma prepared nurse can do X, Y or Z, which we can't really do that at this point in time. And that's not only emergency or ICU related, that's across all postgraduate types of education. So that's just a bit of overview about the types of um, stuff that people spoke about in their courses. And the content uh, amounts varied as well from some courses just doing an hour, some courses doing a whole day. So then it leaves, if you don't do it in undergrad, in-service or postgrad, it leaves this other element. And you can go and do courses if you're associated with organisations like Red Cross or St John Ambulance. You can go and do them. You go and do um, there's courses like MIMS, um, Incident Management System types courses, and there's lots of other places where you can get this education. Often nurses don't go and seek that themselves, though, until after they've been involved in a disaster. So I'm going to wrap up now and talk uh, briefly about other, other things. Disasters happen out of hours. Canberra bushfires happen on a Saturday. Black Saturday happened on a Saturday. Disasters happen out of hours. Who's in charge out of hours? Think about your hospital. Who's in charge out of hours? How many resources are available out of hours? What wards have junior nurses, newly registered nurses as team leaders, alongside enrolled nurses and casuals or agency staff? Disasters happen out of hours and we need to come up with some better ways, I don't know how to do this, to support those types of nurses about who to talk to, who not to talk to, what kinds of things they need to know about disasters when it happens on their shift out of hours. Volunteering. So most people want to 
help out and you want to volunteer obviously to help out because commonly your workplace doesn't pay you to go off to Christchurch or, or to wherever to help out. It's important though not to become a disaster tourist. A disaster tourist is a person who just goes, hey, I need to help out. They jump on a plane, end up in Japan and with their backpack on, walk out and try to help people. What this does is it creates a lot of stress and strain on the already strained infrastructure. So if you turn up to Christchurch CBD in the middle of a disaster because you jumped on an aeroplane in Australia, um, you're going to be relying on their sanitation, their water, their food, etc., etc. They don't have enough for their own community, let alone strays that want to come and help. Most people do this in goodwill. Um, disaster tourists were, um, the best example of disaster tourists was Haiti. So in Haiti, obviously it was massive, massive disaster, a lot of resources. There was a lot of teams on the ground already in field hospitals and so on that were doing their best to help the community. A lot of ethical and so on issues surrounded Haiti, particularly around the level of care that these external teams would provide. They would provide care that that then the normal community couldn't sustain because they don't know how to manage people who have had X, Y, or Z procedure. They don't normally do X, Y, or Z procedure in that community in the first place. So there's a lot of stuff about pre-op, post-operative and, and post-management care of patients in that environment from an ethical perspective. Other ethical issues were, um, there's a, a national, an international research centre for disasters and epidemiology. And they estimated that there should have been about 2,000 uh, surgical amputations of limbs from Haiti's event, there was over 6,000 amputations done. Um, it's known that some of these amputations were done by surgeons who hadn't practiced surgery for about 20 years. Um, so there's a lot of issues around the types of ethical things that people were doing in, in these environments. Then came along the media and medical teams thinking that it would be a good idea to document what they were doing in Haiti. So take for example, and this is a documented case, where there's a well-established team uh, from an international community who is helping the, the local community re-establish a health service and provide health care to those people in that community. There's an old gentleman who has got injuries and that team have made the decision that he is inoperable and is not going to survive. Then comes uh, a superhero team followed by TV cameras. They come down into this community and reassess the patients and say, well, actually, this gentleman here, he is operable. We can, he will be okay. So now they've gone back to the family and gone, actually, there's this team that's come and they're going to save this person. He's all going to be okay and the family's really happy. So they film this occurring and the procedure happening. Then that medical team disappear back to wherever they've come from and take their TV cameras and so on with them. Two days later, this gentleman dies. Now, the result of that for this other team that had been well established in the community was detrimental. The community had lost faith in them, wouldn't believe what they were saying and so on. Um, so detrimental for, for them trying to provide a service based on the fact that there was disaster tourists. Disaster tourists happen just people get interested in, and want to help. Uh, don't always do it in the right way. And the right way is to do it associated with a government um, body such as Department of Health and Ageing or a registered non-government organisation through things such like Red Cross and so on. Commonly, Red Cross have a, a fast um, establishment of services internationally because they already have people on the ground in these environments anyway, so they can quickly establish a health, health service in those environments. Thank you. You've got to think about your employer. Um, your employer is an important person because they give you money. Um, however, out of all of the EBAs in Australia, only three of them mention anything about um, you assisting in a disaster in terms of being paid or remunerated or time off or so on and so on. Um, two out of those three make reference to you in your role as an SES volunteer or a firefighter volunteer role or so on. They don't talk about a health capacity role. There's only one that mentions something about a health capacity role and then it's up to the discretion of the CEO of your hospital as to whether or not they'll let you go um, to a disaster. So in the next round of EBA's offering, um, think about what it says about involvement in disasters. People that went to Christchurch from Queensland, for example, worked about 150 hours in a, in a two-week period. Their EBA doesn't say they're going to get paid for 150 hours. Their EBA says you're employed for an 80-hour fortnight. They got paid 80 hours for a fortnight. They flew back on a Sunday after working 150 hours in a fortnight, were expected to be at work on the Monday because their EBA says that you work Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. 
So we need to be considerate about what you're actually getting yourself into in these circumstances. There's a list. You guys all got your name down on a list to respond in a disaster? No, I don't know where the list is. There's this list out there somewhere that people put their name on it. Um, and we'll walk around the emergency department in 2009 Pacific Ocean tsunami. Who wants to go to be on the list? Everyone puts up their hand. We write everybody's name down. The list is gone. Someone's got a list. It's normally lists of mates, really. Um, and the, the list is done like this. Uh, it, Bandarache tsunami happens and we need people to be at Sydney Airport by 6 a.m. in the morning. What do we do? We need to call around the emergency departments. So we call up a emergency department. Who picks up the phone in the emergency department? The nurse. The nurse. Not anybody. The doctors don't pick up phones. They don't get taught that. The, the nurse picks up the phone in the emergency department. Hi, I'm Jamie in the emergency department. They go, Jamie, we need one nurse and one doctor to be at Sydney Airport 6 a.m. to help out with this disaster. Sure, I'll be there, no dramas. Hey, Dr. So-and-so, we've got to go to this disaster. Yeah, right, let's go. Pack up our gear and off we go. <laughs> That's how disaster response was coordinated for the Indian Ocean tsunami. Um, whilst that was really haphazard, things in some jurisdictions have changed, um, but not all jurisdictions. In terms of volunteering, it's a long process. Media sexy response period, less media sexy recovery period. And we need more people in the recovery period than we need in the response period. So in terms of when you want to volunteer, think about those particular parts um, of disaster response and recovery. The people that are the real heroes aren't the ones that go to the disaster. They're the ones that stay behind and sustain the normal functioning of your health service or hospitals. Um, we, they're the people that we need um, it, particularly during disasters. And a good example of that is 9-11. 9-11 happens, lots of people rush to the sites. Um, the day afterwards, the media only wanted to talk to the first responders who went to the sites. They didn't want to talk to the nurses who stayed back and had to care for 20 patients by themselves. So, in essence, they were probably doing a lot harder work, a lot more risky type work than the people who actually were the first responders to some degree. Thank you. <laughs>